So we will welcome Victor now. Victor Moszczyński, uh, born in Ealing to Polish parents and uh, very active uh, here in the local community, former councillor of Ealing Councillor, uh, great activist in supporting the solidarity campaign uh, in Poland and organizing aid for Poland, medical aid for Poland, and a journalist with Tygodnik Powszechny and so much more. Ah, and the book. Hello, I'm your Polish neighbor. That's the author of the book. <laughs> Welcome, Victor. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, I better just warn you, this is my first ever PowerPoint uh, talk, so uh, maybe a bit of a bumpy ride, so put on your safety belts. But anyway, here goes. Okay, right. Can you all see that? Right. No, no Victor, we still can't see we it. Can't see it. No problem. Uh, Do you want me to take over? Uh, Let's try one yeah. more time. Yeah, Let's try sure. one more time. Okay, I, I can't understand why you can't, but uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Sorry about this. End of show. Uh, okay, I'll come back out of that. Uh, I went back into. Okay, I've done that. I've uh, then need to find. Well, I need to find the there desktop. Brilliant! Just a slideshow from the beginning, and we're okay. ready. We oh, there? Yes, we are. Well done. Lovely. Thank goodness for that. Thank you very much. We are Polish identity and history, with special reference to migration to the UK. Big subject, I'll be as quick as I can. Where do Poles come from? Well, the Polish nation and its language are Slav in origin. Slavs are one of the most numerous ethnic peoples in Europe, residing chiefly in Central, Eastern and Southeastern Europe. But Poles are often described as being in Eastern Europe, but Poles prefer to see themselves as being Central Europeans. And this is why, bang there in the middle of Europe, between the Urals and the Atlantic, Baltic Sea to the north, natural frontiers, natural frontiers of the south are Carpathians, but it's part of the great European plain, so uh, we have open borders uh, with our neighbours, the Germans, sorry, uh, coming back, the Germans uh, and the Russians, uh, not always easy neighbours, uh, as we can see from our history. This is Poland a thousand years ago, 1021. And it's roughly the same outline as you can see here of Poland today. Uh, and this is uh, under Polis of the Brave. His father, Mieszko, in 966, had converted to Christianity in order to protect Poland against German raids. Christianity came from Rome, and that's important because it separates Poles from the more eastern Slavs who accepted their Christianity from Constantinople. And it makes a big difference to the civilizational change. Bolesław expelled all the heathen priesthood, ensured Poland sovereignty, that's Bolesław who, uh, who was king at this time, uh, and by insisting that Poland's new bishops were answerable directly only to the Pope and not to the German archbishop. And this map is roughly as it was, except that you've also got a bit of the Czech Republic and Slovakia in the south, uh, but of course that was only temporary and they're certainly not part of Poland now. Now, uh, after he died, there was a much more turbulent period. The Polish, mo many of the Polish uh, princes from the Piast dynasty were not able to retain sovereignty. They paid homage to the German emperors. The country was divided, wide open to invasion by German Ruthenian princes, also by the order of the Teutonic Knights from the north who cut Poland off from the Baltic. That's this nasty character here in the picture. Poland also underwent destructive Tatar invasions from the east. Finally, in the 14th century, the Kingdom of Poland was restored, unified under Ladislaw the Short and his son, Casimir the Great, who offered Poland 20 years of welcome peace. He was the last ruler from the Piast dynasty. In the 15th century, the Polish nobility arranged for a dynastic union with the pagan Grand Duchy of Lithuania. Lithuania converted to Christianity and Jugaila founded the Jagiellonian dynasty. And together, the two countries destroyed the power of the Teutonic Knights and they gave Poland two centuries of peace and prosperity. And this is what the country looked like. 
It was the largest state in Europe at the time. Uh, the, in 1569, under the Treaty of, of Lublin, uh, Poland and Lithuania actually became a, per, a permanent union, not just a dynastic one. It was called the Commonwealth of Two Nations. Uh, it was a multi-ethnic republic with an elected king. Power was in the hands of the gentry, the Schlachta, which formed at least 10% of the population. And interestingly, although Poland and Lithuania remained a Catholic country following the Reformation in Europe, it tolerated other religions as well, such as the Lutherans, Eastern Orthodox. Uh, there was never any religious war in Poland. Uh, also, in the 13th century, Poland became a safe haven for many nationalities, Armenians, and particularly Jews, who were being expelled from Western European countries. Their culture flourished and they contributed to Poland's prosperity. And the capital, which had been, in the Piast days had been in Krakow, was moved at the end of the uh, 16th century to Warsaw, which was much more central. Uh, when the Agalonia dynasty died out in 1572, Poland-Lithuania elected all its kings from foreign, uh, from different foreign dynasties, and occasionally even native Poles like uh, John Sobieski. And uh, Poland had brilliant generals, powerful standing army, in order to, particularly the heavy cavalry that you see there, in order to protect its open borders and its great commander Sobieski, who saved Austria uh, in 1683 against the Turkish invasion, particularly with a charge from these hussars. From the 17th century, unfortunately, the strain of running such a large country with open borders began to show. Overpowerful nobles disrupted parliamentary governments, betrayed Poland with impunity with foreign powers. And in the end, this is an example of that that you see there. Uh, in the 18th century, Poland was a failed state what we would call it now, with foreign armies marching backwards and forwards across its territories, involved in wars that and had nothing to do with Poland initially. And because it was so weak, the powerful neighbours moved in. Russia, Prussia, Austria, they began slowly to partition Poland, seizing large areas of territory, forcing parliaments each time to accept these losses. There was a national and cultural political resurgence at the end of the 17th century, which led to, 18th century, sorry, which led to the passing of the first liberal constitution in Europe in 1791, the May the 3rd constitution, which we'd be celebrating tomorrow. But even this failed to stop the final partition. And you can see here the green areas became, went to Russia, the blue areas went to Prussia, which later became Germany, and the, the, the red ones to Austria. Poland disappeared off the map, ceased to be an independent state for more than 100 years. It struggled to retain its national identity with its literature, music, painting, its economic activity. The Catholic Church also played a large role in maintaining its national character. Poland had deported Napoleon, who initially defeated all the three partitioning powers, but eventually he failed after his invasion of Russia. And there was a continuous armed struggle for restoring Poland's independence. In 1830, and again in 1863, Armed uprisings were put down brutally by the Russians and in, 1940, in 1848 by the Austrians. The biggest threat actually to Polish culture came from the Prussians who have actually even tried to ban Polish in schools. And then at the First World War, Poland emerged when the three uh, occupying empires collapsed. They filled the empty space uh, with, their, with their armies. They took over this territory. And what you see in front of you is Poland between 1918 and 1939. Poland was partly uh, a multi-ethnic parliamentary democracy in the style of the Jagiellonians, and partly a national state. And it was, a, it was a bit of a conflict between the two, it was a bit of a hybrid. But it had border disputes with all its neighbours. Lithuania, incidentally, was now an independent, fairly hostile state. Uh, Poland had, had to repel a full-scale Soviet invasion in 1980, 1920 at the full gates of Warsaw. And in its 20 years, it managed to rebuild the economy, and unify the administration of the three occupying empires. But then catastrophe. The German and Russian neighbours were determined to crush Poland. Despite futile British and French guarantees of help in September 1939, Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia invaded Poland and the Second World War began. And it was the most disastrous in, uh, period in Poland's thousand year history. The occupiers instituted a reign of terror determined to eliminate Polish cultural and social elites. In the German zone, Poles were treated officially as the Untermensch, a lower order of humans. Behind the newly erected walls of the ghetto set up by the Germans in major Polish cities, Poland's three million strong Jewish population was made to starve 
and then transported along with other European Jews by train to the death camps in places such as Auschwitz and Treblinka to be gassed or else worked to death as part of the final solution. More than six million Polish citizens perished, that's uh, virtually 20% of its population, and half of them were Polish Jews. In the Warsaw Uprising against the Germans, alone 250,000 Polish fighters and civilians were killed. In the Soviet zone, 22,000 members of the Polish elite, mainly officers, prisoners of wars, were also shot. And one and a half million Polish families, along with many Jews and Ukrainians, were deported in cattle trucks to Siberia and Kazakhstan. Only half of them survived. After the German invasion of Russia in 1941, many of the starving deported Poles who had survived in prisons and labor camps and detention centers throughout Russia were amnestied and set up an army in Russia. It was evacuated to the Middle East, took part in the Second Corps under its commander, General Anders, in the Italian campaign, and played a crucial role here in the capture of Monte Cassino in the Apennines in, At in Italy. Polish sailors and ships served alongside the Royal Navy in the Battle of the Atlantic and contributed to the sinking of the Bismarck. The Polish government in exile was set out firstly in France, and when France fell in 1940, the Polish government under General Sikorski moved to England, along with those Polish troops who managed to get out of France. <clears throat> those Polish soldiers served later in the defence of Britain's shores and then in the battles of Normandy and with the Parachute Brigade, which fought at Arnhem. Another Polish army served under British command in North Africa, defended the Tobruk against the Germans. Experienced Polish fighter pilots, like those you see here, based in Northolt and other bases throughout the UK, contributed significantly significantly to victory in the Battle of Britain, and many thousands of Polish crews served in the bomber command over Germany. Over Germany. But, over but, Germany. It, but in the end, over the Second World War was the single worst catastrophe in its Poland's long history. The Ulta Agreement in 45 between the USA, Britain and the Soviet Union left Poland under Soviet-Russian control. Poland's pre-war release faced persecution in the new Poland. Many who supported wartime London governments in exile were imprisoned and some, like Colonel Pilecki here on the right, were executed. The government in exile was no longer recognised by the main Western democracies, but it continued its role as the legitimate government, voiced its protest of post-war settlement and served Poland until 1990 when Poland was free. <coughs> Exiled Poles were dispersed around the world, especially to France, Germany, Canada, Argentina, Australia, as well as the United Kingdom. In the UK, Poles were marginalised and discriminated initially. Polish soldiers were, for instance, were not allowed to march in the 1946 London Victory Parade, which you see here. Members of the Polish Armed Forces were disbanded, but for two years they were given the means to, re to retrain for civilian life in the Polish Resettlement Corps. They lived, many of them, in these camps. Uh, there were the Polish population here was 150,000 in 1951. Um, but others worked in the cities, in the mines, construction and heavy industry. Many prominent Poles, including wartime generals, served in the hospitality uh, season main, uh, uh, sector, mainly often in very menial tasks. The Polish community was well organised. You have a number of organisations here. The Polish Excombatants Association was the largest, with branches and clubs in every British city. Polish Catholic Mission in England and Wales, also one in Scotland. Uh, they had well masses initially in English churches, later they purchased their own. Doctors, lawyers, businessmen, architects, engineers, writers, journalists, all had their own independence associations. Professional teachers set up more than 120 Saturday schools teaching the Polish language, history, geography and in education. Polish Education Society uh, helped in organising these schools and published their own textbooks for them. The pre-war Polish scout movement, the ZHP, was reconstituted, it was very popular. Uh, Polish University Broad was set up, offering degrees, initially in history and literature. Federation of Poles in Great Britain was an umbrella organisation with more than 100 associations as part of it, and it became the main voice for UK Poles. There was a Polish daily published every day in London since 1942. <clears throat> in fact, many elderly Poles could feel that they were still living in an all-embracing pre-war Poland, but on British soil. The Polish Social and Cultural Association, POSC, Many of you may know it, in the 1970s, it was founded in Hammersmith to house the largest Polish library outside Poland, a Polish theatre, gallery and office space for numerous Polish organisations. All these organisations acted with a sense of mission as they saw themselves as the voice of an independent free Poland. 
Most supported the government in exile and took part in demonstrations against the Polish regime and the Soviet leaders. A large majority of the leading Poles refused to take a UK passport or travel to Poland before 1990. After 1980, a second generation of Poles born in the UK took up the struggle, campaigned in the support of Polish solidarity uh, and against martial law in Poland. After 1990, many of the surviving exiled veterans and political writers in the UK were treated as celebrities in Poland, but few returned to stay there. Younger second generation Poles travelled to Poland as advisors to Polish business or government. Polish activity continued with campaigns to abolish visas for Poles, to retain Polish language at GCSE and A-level, to campaign for Poland to join the European Community and NATO. Polish population had dropped uh, in 1991 to only 73,000, uh, 2001 to just 60,000 as opposed to 150,000 before. You know, some of our veterans who took part in uh, every year uh, in the uh, parades uh, to, before the Cenotaph on National Remembrance Sunday. And then Poland joined the EU. Uh, Poles were invited to come here. The EU's citizens travelled to work here and eventually settle. Far more came than the UK government had expected. The uh, Poles had set up their families, created their own local organisations and news media, both printed and online, watched Polish TV rather than UK, rebuilt a new little Poland in each town in the UK, particularly in rural areas. And by this time, most of the former Polish provincial clubhouses had been shut, so the Poles organised themselves largely around parishes. Organisations like the Polish Catholic Mission, POSC, Polish Education Society, the Polish Union of Engineers still continue to serve both the old and the new communities. Polish workers were praised for their work ethic, but attacked in red top press like the Daily Mail and Daily Express, and sometimes faced hate attacks in public, particularly during the Brexit campaign. In 2017, the Office of National Statistics estimated nearly one million people of Polish nationality in this country. Polish language is the most common uh, in foreign language uh, in the UK that, that was spoken at home. For 10 years, there had been an average 20,000 plus Polish children born here every year, the largest foreign national group in, the, in that situation. Following Brexit uh, and COVID, the population dropped by about 10%. Largely intend to stay and have, uh, uh, have, uh, have applied en masse uh, for settled status. This last uh, panel the self identity of UK Poles. Poland's long colourful history, particularly the more recent experiences of oppression, have an impact on their sense of identity. A strong sense of national pride. They're respectful of Catholic tradition, sometimes very fervent Catholics, but tolerant of other faiths. Respect for democratic traditions and personal freedoms. Remember, they were a parliamentary uh, republic for many centuries. Hunger for culture and education as means of social progress. Parents want to pass on knowledge of Poland and its language and tradition to their children, even in mixed marriages. There's also a certain stubbornness, but also a strong worth ethic. A spirit of enterprise in the Polish character, reflecting traditional survival skills in a foreign environment. The Polish community remaining after Brexit is likely to integrate well into the economy in fact, is integrating well into the economy and the British well, way of life, but still retains its distinctive character. The Polish community is seeking integration, but without assimilation. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry that if, I, if it's taken a, a bit too long, but uh, thank you. Thank you, Victor. And we let you go on longer because you've provided so much background, which has been very useful for you for tonight, but also for the other three, three events as well, so for the whole series of events. So thank you for that. Um, we haven't got any questions. We've got a recommendation from Roman Bednas recommending the book First to Fight by David Morehouse.